Lauren and Gronya, thank you so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, James. So I can see in the chat that people are joining from all over. So morning, afternoon, evening. Special thanks for those that are joining us really late or really early in the morning. Uh, so today, as James has mentioned, we'll be talking to you about correcting the scholarly record and dispelling myths around corrections. So this is a topic both Gronia and I are particularly interested in that we work on on a daily basis. And we've teamed up to discuss this topic so we can explain corrections in a wider context. Between us, we have experience working in large and medium sized publishers that publish health research, STEM, physical sciences and humanities disciplines. So we hope the session will be really informative. Before we get started, we do have a poll we would really appreciate you taking so that we can gauge everyone's perceptions towards corrections now. And we'll have another poll at the end of the session to understand if and how your perceptions towards corrections may have changed. So um, be great if you can launch the poll, please, James. Great. The poll's now live, everyone. Lovely, thank you. Next slide, please, Gronia. So the points that we'll be covering today are the following. So what is a correction? Who decides what needs to be corrected? Who is responsible for corrections and their impact? What are the barriers to correcting the scholarly literature? And uh, we'll be discussing some takeaways. And of course, there'll be opportunity for questions. We've split the slides between us based on our areas of particular interest in correction. So we will be handing over to one another throughout to discuss um, particular questions. So I will now be handing over to Gronia to talk us through what a correction is. Thanks very much, Lauren. Um, so I think that what James said at the start is really nice. And I think that's one of the key takeaways that we want everyone to get from today is that mistakes happen um, and what we want, what the topic of today is and what I think um, really should make the difference is what happens after a mistake is discovered. Um, what do we do? What do publishers do? What do research institutions do? What do researchers do? So well, I wanted to start with defining what we mean by a correction. Um, and we're using this as an umbrella term to cover a lot of post-publication, different kinds of post-publication notices that correct, update or append an original article and usually are bringing uh, a reader's attention to either founded concerns or potential um, inaccuracies in uh, that piece of research, be it a data publication or research publication, um, whatever. One of the things that I'm coming, I mentioned here and I'm then going to mention throughout the presentation is the importance of uh, neutrality um, and transparency in any correction notice um, as publishers, um, Lauren, we have a responsibility for making sure that any correction notice is um, as objectively factual and neutral um, as possible. So drilling down into what exactly a correction is and what they look like. So how they look and what they say differs, but they should all meet the same high level, high level of industry standards, um, like articles or other research publications, correction notices have a DOI, um, and this guarantees their persistency. Um, a lot of what we talk about today is going to be about strengthening and reassuring trust in the scholarly record um, and the persistency and stability um, of corrections is a really big part in fostering that trust. Now, typically, the original article is not updated. Um, there are industry standard exceptions, and Lauren's going to talk a little bit um, about this, you know, for example, um, when it, where an article is retracted. But there are also less standardized uh, exceptions to this. For example, if the correction or the inaccuracy relates to like a legal concern or potentially um, privacy uh, um, violation of an individual. Um, this varies by publisher and every publisher has their has a different policy of um, what, when they will update the original article. So Carragher, for example, we publish um, a lot of health sciences research. And so for us, it's really important that anything that could potentially impact patient care is accurate. So for example, if the um, error is in something to do with um, you know, drug dose, uh, we would update um, the original article so that there's no compromising um, patient care. Uh, but what's really important about that is the transparency. So if we if the original article has to be updated um, for, where, for whatever reason, and we would always state in the correction notice that that's what's been done. Um, and related to the transparency is the bi-directional linking. 
So this is really important for discovery of correction notices. Um, as publishers, we have a, a responsibility to make it as clear as possible to readers um, if there is an error and what that error is. Um, and that's where the bidirectional linking comes in for discoverability and transparency um, of the existence of a correction. So there are lots of different kinds of correction notices. Um, and I've grouped them here about what they say about the reliability um, of an article. Um, and I'm gonna talk um, about the first category here, which is um, where the main findings of the work are still reliable. Um, and this is where we come to the first myth. Um, we're gonna keep using this iconography throughout the presentation where uh, it, there is a misconception potentially or a myth um, related to corrections that we want to bat away. Um, I'm, the image came before the analogy, so sorry, but, <laughs> sorry if it's a bit laboured. Um, so the uh, first myth that we're going to talk about is that um, correction always means that there's something fundamentally wrong with a piece of research, and clearly this isn't true. Um, mistakes happen, um, as we mentioned, and honest error is just that, honest, an error. And the most common category, um, the most common kind of notice in the category where the conclusions are still reliable is an erratum or a corrigendum. Um, now, these labels are approximately the same. Some publishers use exclusively one or exclusively the other. For example, at Carger, we exclusively use um, an erratum for this. Um, and publishers might use a mix of both, um, perhaps to indicate you know, something of a publisher error or an, uh, an author error. Um, again, publishers will have a policy on uh, what they will issue an erratum or a corrigendum for. Um, and for example, at Carger, we'll issue um, an erratum if the error uh, impacts the article contents of meta or metadata, but the conclusions of the article itself are still reliable. Um, so notice of uh, redundant publication is much rarer and is typically used where two articles are published containing redundant information, but the conclusions of both are independently still uh, reliable and valid. So an example might be if two, if two groups of researchers independently concurrently publish um, on the same data set or the same individual um, and the uh, there's no indication of misconduct and the results and conclusions of both um, are still valid. Uh, we would issue a notice of redundant publication just in the interest of transparency for the reader to alert them to the fact that there is another um, separate publication um, using the same uh, data set or individual. Um, and then we move on to the category of corrections that I mentioned where the conclusions may not be reliable. Um, and typically this means that there's an ongoing investigation um, into an article or a research publication um, or a data publication and the concerns are not likely to be resolved imminently. Um, and this is an expression of concern. So publishers have their own policies about when to issue an expression of concern and what threshold is reached for an expression of concern is issued. Um, typically, but not comprehensively, this is be if conclusions of an investigation are not likely to be uh, reached for a long time, for example, if there's an ongoing institutional investigation, um, or if the concerns are very serious and timely um, and the readership needs to be made aware of the potential inaccuracy. So um, for example, anything to do with COVID um, during the pandemic, it was um, as a matter of urgency that the readership be made aware. Uh, James, do you have your hand up on purpose? Uh, no, that was me hitting the wrong okay. button, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just had something really uh, urgent to say about expressions of concern. Uh, <laughs> so finally, um, the, the category of corrections where uh, it's clear that the conclusions of an article are not reliable, um, either because of honest error or because of deliber deliberate obfuscation. And in these instances, a retraction notice will be issued. Now, this is the only, as I mentioned, this is the only um, kind of correction where it's industry standard that the published article will be updated. Um, and we have a response, and this is because we as publishers have a responsibility to make it um, unequivocally clear to readers that um, an article has been retracted because the results um, or conclusions are unreliable. Um, and so that further research isn't built uh, upon that. Um, retractions, of course, come in all shapes and sizes and so for lots of different reasons. They might be as a result of a lengthy investigation into misconduct, um, or it might be because an author contacts us because they noticed there's a coding error in their analysis script that undermines their results and the article needs to be retracted. Um, and then I'm going to touch, I just wanted to touch briefly on the some kinds of correction notices that are used a little bit um, inconsistently between publishers and not necessarily all, and not all publishers publish um, all kinds of correction notices. Um, 
some publishers have a policy for withdrawing articles post-publication and issuing a withdrawal notice. Um, on the other hand, for example, at Carger, if an uh, article needs to be totally removed from the scholarly record, for example, because there's a legal or a privacy um, violation concern, we'll issue a standard retraction notice um, and state in that notice that the article's contents um, are withdrawn, again, about that transparency, um, so it's clear to readers what happened. Um, but it should be noted that it's like, industry best practice um, not to erase completely an article's existence, again, because all articles have been issued with a DOI um, uh, in our hands. The If it's that example where the um, article needs to be withdrawn from the scholarly record, the DOI remains valid, the article page remains valid, um, but the PDF um, and the web version is erased except for the title page um, information. And that's just, again, coming back to that transparency um, for our readers um, and researchers so that you know, for me, transparency equals trust. Um, and we want people to be able to trust the content that we have. So these categories about what uh, they say about the reliability, what the correction notice says about the reliability of the original article, you know, who defines this and how how have we all come to use these in the same way? Uh, well, there's a lot of industry guidance um, for that, that um, supports us. And for that, I'm gonna hand back over to Lauren. Thank you. So yeah, as Gronya has mentioned, she's touched upon industry guidelines. So there are numerous industry bodies that have set out advisory standards that publishers are expected to abide by when issuing corrections. They ensure publishers act responsibly and consider the far reaching and long term consequences of altering the scholarly record. The main bodies um, that provide this guidance include ICMJE, ST STM, COPE, the Council of Science Editors and PubMed. So one of the primary guidance documents is STM's um, Preservations of the Objective Record of Science, which was first drafted in 2006 um, and was last updated in 2017. So these industry principles have been recommended for many years. So at the core of the principles are the following points, and I have also included our own interpretations um, of, of these points. So firstly, the scholarly record should be tampered with as little as possible. Changes must not be undertaken lightly. Therefore, we can effectively, this, this effectively um, sets a threshold, as it were, that, that must be met. Do the requested changes warrant for alterations to the scholarly record to be met in light of the consequences, which we will discuss shortly? If warranted, um, a correction should be published as soon as reasonably possible. Once a paper is officially published, the publication is permanent. It is now discoverable and citable. So the paper um, cannot be removed, hidden, moved. And what we move, uh, mean by moved is assigned a new DOI. Content should not be withdrawn unless the situation meets strict criteria. And by withdrawn, we mean completely taken down. So the, the situations... Uh, where, where we would consider a withdrawal is, um, for example, say the research poses a risk to the public if acted upon, um, if it's subject to a legal dispute, violation of the privacy of a research subject, may, maybe contains defamation, etc. The bibliographic information about the like removed article should be retained for the scientific record. The version of an article um, a journal accepts is the version that is published. So what we mean by that is author proofs is an opportunity for the authors to remedy any minor errors. Changes that technically undermine the reviewer's recommendation should be investigated further and rejected if warranted. So for example, the references is a really important portion of a manuscript that the reviewers will consider, and this will influence their recommendations to the editor on the manuscript's um, suitability for publication. Therefore, making changes to the references post acceptance technically subverts the peer review process, and that's irrespective of irrespective of whether you know it's intentional or not therefore any requested changes that go beyond correcting minor errors are taken extremely seriously notices must always sit in front of the paywall and be clearly visible on the article landing page it's important notices remain objective and accurately explain the situation at hand so the explanation of the concerns should be a truthful account of events Publishers' primary concern um, is to ensure the content that we publish is is accurate. I really can't stress that enough. That in, you know underpins our entire um, approach to to corrections. 
Published content is considered to be a snapshot in time, so it can't be updated to reflect recent events, for example. The scholarly, you know, published content can be considered to be effectively the bibliographic minutes of scholarship. It is worth noting an exception to these policies, and that is uh, name change requests. So um, in, in these instances where an author wishes to change their name, um, for published content. The publisher reviews the request to ensure it's genuine. Yes, we sadly have received fraudulent requests to change an author's name. So we do make stringent checks first and we will correct the name without a notice if the requester prefers this and the publisher retains a copy of the original article for its records. Next slide, please. So how are corrections done and what form do they take? So it, it does very much depend on the correction, but the process is usually the following. So um, it is determined that a correction is required and the notice wording is drafted. The authors are then afforded the opportunity to comment on the wording, any suggested amendments that continue to meet our commitment to be objective and accurately explain the inaccuracies are made. The wording is then passed to the production team who liaise with typesetters to publish the notice with the exception of publishers notes and sometimes expressions of concern, you know, these, this can vary across publishers as Grony has mentioned. The notice is published separately and linked back to the original article. The article title is changed if appropriate. So this often happens with corrigendums and um, retractions. Certainly at IOP, we do this with retractions. So the term retracted is included at the start of the article title. And this is to help readers and discovery sites easily identify these articles when they've been um, retracted. The link to the notice and or the notice itself features on the article landing page, usually below the bibliographic information. And then sometimes a page is inserted at the start of the article that includes the notice. Again, that's usually um, reserved for retractions. The body of the article is amended if applicable or an updated version of the article is issued alongside the original. Again, that's very dependent on the publisher, um, you know, which, which um, option they, they choose really. A watermark is added uh, for retractions. Um, indexes and discovery sites receive updated information about the articles so they can reflect the changes in their sites. If a retraction has been issued, many publishers comment um, on their other articles page on PubPeer, inform funders, data repositories, preprint servers, and inform retraction watch directly so their database can be updated. Again, this is something that um, we both we both do. Um, so just to note here, we don't comment on PubPeer or tell um, retraction what's in terms of, um, I think that's that's Carga that, that doesn't. It's certainly at IOP, we um, submit the, the form with, with retraction watch so that it can be added to their, their database. So um, we then move on to Crossmark. This can be used by, by users who have locally saved copies of the work to implement any updates to the article. So if, say, the PDF of the article is saved to your computer, um, there is a Crossmark logo often featured on the first page. If you click that, it does update the article so it will um, reflect any um, any corrections that have been made. Site um, and Retraction Watch Zotero integration um, do empower readers as well to keep informed about uh, research and avoid citing unreliable research. And then for published articles, the correction will feature, uh, sorry, in uh, print published articles, the correction will, will feature in the next issue. So as you can see, there, there is a lot to this, uh, this process. Um, there's many steps that do, do need to uh, be followed. Next slide, please, Gronia. So who decides what needs to be corrected? Given publishers implement corrections and they have a responsibility to ensure industry guidelines are abided by, it is effectively the publisher. However, I do want to stress that the process of reviewing a situation where a correction is warranted is done in partnership with the journal editor-in-chief and or editorial board and the authors. It's the editor-in-chief, editorial team and subject experts who decide whether a work is published in the first place. So they should also um, evaluate if corrections to the scientific content are made to it as well. In some instances, we may work closely with the author's institution and we sometimes require their support or you know, they, they've passed their, their findings to an investigation conducted by them to, to us. 
So um, this may sound a little bit dramatic, but um, it's very true. Publishers are custodians of the content and take this responsibility very seriously. Therefore, certainly speaking on behalf of IOPP and Carga, in every instance, with no exception, we do make checks and review all requests. If a request does not meet industry guidelines or our own guidelines or the relevant laws in the countries where we operate, we will deny the request. Next slide, please. So following on um, with this question of who decides what needs to be corrected, we thought um, it would be useful to help explain this process we, we go through um, when we investigate an ethical concern that warrants a correction. We've set out how we would do this for a typical, say, plagiarism investigation case, and this is based on COPE's respective flowchart. But the, the process is very similar for many kinds of post-publication investigations. So firstly, the complainant, this could be a reader, whistleblower, the editorial team, you know, other internal colleagues, etc., informs the editor in chief or publisher about suspected plagiarism. Either the editor responds explaining the journal will investigate or it's passed to the publisher who reviews the allegation. They send the email and request any re relevant information or materials that will support with the investigation. Next slide, please. Following on from this, the editor or usually the publisher reviews the concerns by using research integrity tools such as cross-ref similarity check that's provided by, by Turnitin. It's the publisher's version of um, plagiarism software, uh, plagiarism detection software even. And uh, we manually read the, the content to compare the two works. The latter is carried out when the work has been paraphrased. Um, so just to add here, in terms of paraphrasing, this does mean the content isn't sufficiently different enough. Um, concerns over plagiarism would remain. We expect content to be reworked and sufficiently expanded upon uh, rather than, than paraphrased. It wouldn't remedy um, overlap. Um, the publisher then liaises with the editor to help understand the level of overlap, you know, if, if any, um, from a subject expert perspective, so we can understand the impact the overlap has on the work. Dependent on the nature of the publication and the potentially similar source, this can result in back and forth communication and take quite, quite a while. Next slide, please. Once the level of overlap and impact are assessed, either the publisher or editor contact the authors. Um, usually this is all authors, not just the corresponding author. Um, and it, that we, the correspondence that we send is always in neutral terms. Um, so as to afford the opportunity to, you know, explain the situation. Next slide, please. If a response is received, this is reviewed by the publisher and editor to assess whether it is satis satisfactory. So what we mean by that is no further concerns remain or say it was an honest error. Or if the response is unsatisfactory, so that would be concerns remain or say, you know, they, they admit guilt. For, uh, more information may be requested from the authors, which would need to go through the same review process. Sometimes the responses raise more questions than answers. So this, again, can cause some delay and back and forth. And this can, can last months and months. Um, you know, it, it very much depends on the, the situation, really, the nature of the similar source. Sometimes it could be a PhD thesis, which is incredibly long. Um, and, you know, we, we would want to ensure that we make thorough checks. So we would need to look through, you know, the, the entire thesis, etc. The editor and publisher discuss whether inaccuracies in the work remain and require a correction. Um, with the author's explanation assessed alongside the evidence to hand. So this would usually be a corrigendum or a ratum um, for publishers who don't use corrigendums or a retraction. Next slide, please. If there is no response, the authors are chased several times. Um, but if a response is received and is insufficient for STEM and humanities research, we would proceed with considering next steps. For health research, we may ask the institution to conduct their own investigation into the concerns. Next slide, please. So an expression of concern may be issued in certain cases, such as when an author doesn't reply. So we anticipate the case will take longer, but it's important to inform the readership of the um, concerns raised and the fact that the investigation is ongoing. Um, it could also be that there's potentially a third party involved, such as the author's institution, institution like Gronia mentioned. If there is no response from the authors, this won't necessarily preclude a correction from being issued, but we do need to ensure we we do um, 
we we make all attempts are made to reach the authors and uh, so that they are afforded the opportunity to provide their account of events so further attempts including reaching out to their institution and researching alternative um, contact details will be carried out next slide please if the response was satisfactory we would thank the author a correction may still be warranted, um, in which case the wording is drafted, usually by the publisher, and sent to the editor for their feedback. Once agreed upon, the wording will be sent to the authors for them to comment on. The authors may have questions, which could result in further discussions between the authors, publishers and editor. The correction, once everybody you know, has had that, that chance to review, um, it's, it's processed by the publisher, their production team or, or the typesetters. Formatting queries may need to be resolved with the typesetters that would usually be between the publisher and typesetters. Once issued, the authors and complainant are informed separately. Other parties such as the author's institution, pub peer, retraction watch, etc., as we discussed, um, may be informed. Next slide, please. At IOPP, we inform the author's institution in every case that results in a retraction. Most publishers will contact the institution in serious cases, so any further investigations and outcomes can be can be actioned. So I will pass you back over to Gronya, who will, um, she'll discuss with you who is responsible for the accuracy of publications. Um, and for those of you that are having Chris Whitty flashbacks. Yes, we've made all the jokes before we started the presentation. It's okay, you can say it as well. Um, we're really delighted to have this audience to speak to about this subject because I think Lauren's example really showed um, how everybody is involved in maintaining the accuracy of the scholarly record um, and everybody has a role to play and responsibility within that. Um, there we go. Uh, so Lauren and I have touched on briefly um, the publisher's responsibility when it comes to issuing correction notices and doing investigations, but this responsibility doesn't start post-publication, it starts pre-publication. Um, both IOPP and Carver have extensive pre-publication submission um, screening, both technologically and human-driven, to identify potentially inaccurate content before it's published, because obviously the best way to have a um, mistake-free scholarly record is to not publish it in the first place. Um, again, a publisher's responsibility is to transparency, and I know I'm saying this again and again and again, but it really underpins how important um, I think transparency is for trust in the scholarly record. Um, to be a publisher of trusted content requires us to be transparent in our correction notices, and as Lauren already said, prompt in investigations into concerns raised, while of course investigating without bias, fairly and thoroughly, um, before any sort of issuing any sort of correction notice. Um, and this brings me to another myth that we have, uh, we hear sometimes that um, publishers wash their hands of content once it's published, they don't care if they publish something and it's inaccurate. Um, this couldn't be less true, both Carger and IOPP um, not only respond to concerns um, about our published content, but proactively go looking for potential inaccuracies um, in our published content, as well as all the pre-publication checks. We're doing everything we can to safeguard the scholarly record. Um, I think the person, the, the the player that comes to mind maybe straight away when you think about um, maintaining the accuracy of the scholarly record is authors, because they really are the ones who know the most about their own work, not readers, not publishers, not institutions. And so a lot of responsibility is with them to make sure their content is accurate, even pre-submission um, through rigorous note taking and record keeping. I think authors, you know, I said at the start, mistake ha mistakes happen um, and, uh, authors have a responsibility to inform their co-authors and journal publishers if an error is discovered post-publication. Um, you know, James already touched on this, uh, um, but this is something they experience as well. Anecdotally, researchers tell me that they would be reluctant to issue a correction notice because they think that their colleagues would think less of them. You know, there might be negative impact on their promotion opportunities or ability to acquire funding if they have a correction notice. Um, and this is the kind of attitude that a Carger and IOPP and through this webinar that we're really trying to eradicate, we want to normalize making um, corrections and issuing corrections. Um, as, a, as a publisher, we would never issue uh, a, correction notice as a correction notice as a punitive measure ever. Um, our focus, uh, um, as with anyone in the research ecosystem, is just about the accuracy of the record, and we rely on authors to support us in this. Um, and it, for that, through that support, one of the things we rely on is their cooperation 
um, in an investigation either by a publisher or by a research institution, because it's, again, it's in everyone's interest that the scholarly record is accurate. Um, and this brings me to the next myth that nobody wants to hear if you've um, identified something that could be a potential inaccuracy in their work. Um, readers have, in my experience, been the starting point of many, many of correction notices that we issue. Um, and this is increasing, I think, um, with the increase in active image and data sleuths, for want of a better word, um, in the community. Um, and I would always say that an author is the best point of contact um, about a potential inaccuracy in a piece of work. You saw in Lauren's example that a publisher kind of acts as a sort of middleman between the reader, the author, the editor, the publisher, the, re the research institution and the readership. Um, and where there is just a misunderstanding, um, this can be cleared up a lot faster within the community itself. Um, but I think it's really important to note that not all readers are comfortable approaching authors to you know, point out that there's a potential inaccuracy in their work. Um, and that might be because they're from a community that's historically underrepresented in science, they're an early career researcher, or they otherwise fear some sort of retribution for pointing out an inaccuracy. Um, I think that institutions here have can play a big role in normalizing supportive and constructive feedback between peers um, outside of the peer review process. And that's part of the things that we wanted to talk about today. But in any case, Readers can, should, and do contact publishers um, about potential errors, um, be it after unsatisfactory conversation with the authors or having not contacted the authors at all. Uh, so I said that it's really important, the, you know, the best way of uh, an accurate scholarly record is to not publish inaccurate content in the first place. And that's um, where reviewers have a huge um, role and responsibility in supporting um, a rigorous pre-publication. Um, screening process to identify any potential in inaccuracies. As subject experts, the really best place to identify any potential inaccuracies in um, a piece of work um, and reporting that to a body responsible for investigating it, be it you know, in a review report to authors, contacting the editor, contacting the journal's editorial office, contacting the publisher's research integrity office. This can vary between publishers, but I think, uh, seeing something and saying something for a reviewer is really important. Um, and similarly to reviewers, editors have a role in uh, and a responsibility in identifying potential errors um, pre-publication um, and reporting these again to somebody responsible for the accuracy um, of that content. Every Every journal and publisher ha may have a slightly different process. You know, at Carger and IOPP, there's a dedicated research integrity team that does um, the investigations. This might be different in um, other publishers. Um, editors, as those ultimately responsible for the content, as, as Laura mentioned, are responsible for ensuring that an investigation is conducted into potential inaccuracies in articles in the journal. Um, and this may be by investigating the article themselves or supporting the journal's editorial office or a research integrity team in investigating it. Again, every publisher has a different process um, for reporting errors and investigating them. Most of the time this is transparently indicated on the journal web pages. But if you are an editor or reviewing for a journal and you don't know what the process is, I would always encourage you to reach out to the journal's editorial office and ask. And then finally, I um, want to talk about the the key role that institutions have in affecting mindset change um, that we think is really needed to uh, destigmatize the correction process um, because we all are ultimately here with the same goal of uh, ensuring that uh, the accuracy of the scholarly record. Uh, UK Rio have, I know, a lot of resources um, for institutions looking to foster um, that kind of culture. And I know many institutions already have an active program um, around promoting a positive research culture and solid research practices. Um, but I, the, the idea, and James mentioned this, the idea that a, a correction notice will have um, a negative impact on an individual's career, I think is another one of these myths that we need to move away from um, through, through culture change, through mindset change. Uh, because it can't, as James said, and um, we didn't coordinate, but he, he pointed out exactly what I wanted to say. It can't be the case that we promote the um, importance of an accurate and appropriately corrected scholarly record on one hand and penalize the correction, that correction itself uh, on the other when it comes to the individual. So I think in as well as 
culture and mindset change, um, institutions have a responsibility to investigate concerns about research carried out by individuals, either hosted by or employed by them, um, and reporting the outcome of any investigations to research and or data publishers. Again, be it honest error, be it deliberate obfuscation, so that the scholarly record can be updated. Um, and we wanted to touch on like what is the what is the actual impact on the scholarly record um, of a correction notice? You know, everyone in the ecosystem is working together, reporting things, investigating things when an error is noticed. What happens? What's the impact on the scholarly record? And for that, I'll hand back over to Lauren. Thank you. So um, as, as I alluded to earlier, uh, with every correction request, we sort of assess that against the potential consequences. Uh, there are numerous consequences to correcting the scholarly record. So firstly, removing or editing content could impact on another academic's research. So if the paper has been drawn upon and referenced in other works, and we then take it down from our website, we remove all evidence of it. This removes the evidence the other works are based on, which makes them incorrect. So even with citation metrics, that could, this can be really hard to track. The work could be cited in government policy documents and other unpublished works, such as you know student thesis, draft publications, etc., that you know are not tracked by um, citation metrics. It means we we may never know the true extent or impact of this action. Imagine if the earlier research papers on certain diseases, medicines, etc., just disappeared. And I'm genuinely going to pause there for a moment for you to ponder that. Imagine if they just disappeared. This is why we take it so incredibly seriously, um, you know, withdrawals and making any corrections to the scholarly record. Uh, retractions are the most serious correction we can issue and effectively mark the content as null and void. So the article isn't usually removed um, due to my previous point. They can have a significant impact on an author's career. This is something publishers are extremely conscious of. When we investigate cases and believe a retraction is warranted, we triple check all evidence to hand, the facts of the situation and the author's explanation to the concerns before proceeding. So we know we are absolutely sure if it you know, is the right course of action to take in that particular instance. If a paper has been cited using a full academic reference in other people's works and we amend, say, the article title or move it into a different issue, basically, if you imagine in your, your head, you can visualise a reference. You've got the author's, you know, et al. year, the, the title, then you've got the, the journal um, title, volume issue. So imagine if any changes to that are made. This will cause the references to the work before this point to be incorrect. So going forwards, author citation indexes may incorrectly think the paper is in fact two separate publications, which would result in what we call split citations for the authors. So this is regardless of how minor the changes to the reference. If there's any changes to that reference, that this could be caused. So citation metrics are, of course, considered to be an important measure of an author's impact, making this a very key factor to you know, consider, it obviously wouldn't kind of, you know, pr preclude a correction, but this is something, you know, sometimes it is warranted for us to um, inform authors of this. Their paper will, of course, be indexed in certain discovery sites and databases, which may incorrectly index the paper for some time. So, for example, Google Scholar currently crawls publishers' uh, websites to implement any updates to their records once every six months, unless it's an author name change. So this could mean the author's work is incorrectly listed in Google Scholar for up to six months and will exasperate the issues with split citations. Any print issues distributed prior to changing its, you know, the citation of the work, as I've discussed, will be incorrect and are difficult to recall. So if we think secondhand copies, once they're out in the ether, they're, they're gone. <laughs> There's no way of getting them back. So as a result, the electronic format of the issue will no longer mirror the print copies in circulation. If we are thinking of amending an article title, again, the above factors will need to be considered and a new copyright license will need to be signed by the authors. So these are all important factors for a publisher to consider. And, uh, you know, as I've said, while some don't preclude our, you know, imp sorry, impede our ability to issue a correction, as a responsible publisher, we take these factors into account and advise authors accordingly.
next slide please oh, i'll hand over to gronia so what we've done is summarize some of the the myths that you've seen featured on some of these slides so we'll be um commenting on them i'll pass you over to gronia i think we both when we were discussing this webinar and what we wanted to um people to take away like we wanted this not to just be a uh, theoretical discussion um about corrections what they are like we both wanted to clarify what a correction is and what it isn't and um, support researchers in issuing corrections, but we also wanted it to be very um, action oriented. And so that's why we have these kind of summary slides on all the myths that we talk about um, throughout the presentation and what do we think is some of the solutions to some of the misconceptions. Uh, so I think Lauren's last slide was a really nice example of um, how clear it is that issuing a correction notice is very serious because um, the accuracy of the scholarly record is serious business. But that doesn't always mean that there's something wrong with the research that is being corrected. Um, and so the, as I mentioned, it, for a lot of correction notices, um, the conclusions of the article itself uh, remain valid. And again, I keep saying it, mistakes happen um, and it's responsibility on publishers to be really clear um, in our, and transparent in our uh, correction statement so that it is um, apparent to a reader where there is an inaccuracy and the impact, if any, um, on the conclusions to move away from the idea that uh, a correction notice means that in all cases, there's something fundamentally wrong with the research. Um, and I think that leads to the point about how important it is um, for a publisher to safeguard the accuracy of their content well after publication, because both Carger and IOPP are active throughout the cycle of knowledge, you know, during uh, pre-submission, during research design, during publication and, and post-publication um, in terms of promoting best research practice, screening manuscript submissions, um, to help minimize the chances of inaccuracies making their way to the scholarly record. Um, and however mistakes happen, um, be it deliberate or um, accidental, and both publishers are, have active research integrity teams investigating concerns about manuscripts and articles and communicate with everybody in the research ecosystem to resolve um, any issues post publication. Um, and I think that fits nicely to the next point is on uh, communicating about concerns uh, identified post publication that nobody wants to hear um, if you've identified something that could potentially be wrong. Um, Readers should be able to help authors and everyone else in the research ecosystem maintain the accuracy of their work by pointing out potential errors without consequences. Um, and by this, I mean, I, I don't uh, I, I don't mean that um, readers should become a reviewer, too, and send, uh, you know, inflammatory comments to authors. I mean, mutual respect, I think, is really important here. Um, and I think that everybody in the research ecosystem um, has a responsibility in promoting that like mindset change and culture change uh, to a more supportive and collaborative uh, one providing feedback. I hand over to Lauren. Thank you. So um, firstly, kind of what one of the, the batting away myths that you will have seen on the slides, correcting an error in a publication will have a negative impact on a researcher's career. So part of a good research culture must be one in which mistakes are avoided through um, planning, but acknowledged as a neutral event without assuming intent. So a researcher's commitment to transparency and accuracy of the scholarly record should be viewed as a positive trait by institutions, colleagues and funders. And we think the first step to this is through normalising the correction process, perhaps by explaining how to correct a mistake or by directing your researchers to webinars like this one. Secondly, you know, published content um, cannot usually be withdrawn upon request. When it can, this is an exception rather than, than the rule. So we receive countless requests to withdraw content. And it's clear for some authors they're under the impression that it's easy to kind of erase their article and it can be corrected and published elsewhere. I've experienced many instances where authors have got in touch to ask you know, for their, their work to be withdrawn with only a brief explanation of the issues. Once they know they're unable to withdraw, they stop corresponding with us. So we're left with a notification of potential errors in the work 
and a difficult job trying to investigate and verify the concerns without cooperation from the authors. So if there's a greater awareness around how permanent a publication is and the potential impact of correcting, more authors will hopefully conduct more thorough checks on their work prior to submission and work more closely with us to correct, um, you know, any issues that, you know, any inaccuracies in their work rather than kind of take the view that their work could always be withdrawn if something is found to be, to be wrong with it. And finally, publishers can't um, agree to all correction requests they receive. Again, we receive a high number of requests because there, there is a misconception any and all corrections can be issued. This does mean we can get a bit bogged down in requests, which impedes our ability to promptly conduct checks and issue corrections when it's warranted. So if requesters understand the principles we must follow, this will help streamline and exped uh, expedite the uh, issuing process. I'll hand back over to Gronia. So James uh, used the phrase about research being self-correcting at the start, and this is something like this is a statement that I've never particularly um, uh, seen myself in because of the use of the, the kind of passive voice here the about sentiment that science or research is self-correcting um, kind of always made me laugh in that way because, you know, who is the self? Um, and so I think that uh, one of the takers I wanted people we wanted people to have from this webinar is that the self is everybody in the research ecosystem um, and all of us be it editors researchers publishers re research institutions have a small part in uh, making a scientific landscape in which inaccurate content is corrected quickly and transparently um, or avoided being published at all um, and this doesn't happen obviously in a vacuum um, and I think everyone that I mentioned as well as funders and societies who are active in the research space all have a role in recognizing correcting the literature as important work um, that we have a shared responsibility for. Uh, and with that note, um, we'll take the poll once more uh, to see if anyone people's attitudes have changed when it comes to uh, corrections. If you could launch the poll, James, please. So perhaps while people are filling that in, I can see that there's some questions. So I don't know if we want to take some questions in the last 10 minutes. And thank you everybody for listening. Um, this is something we've, Lauren might feel very passionately about. So it's great to get to talk about it. Yeah, Lauren Griner, thank you so much. Those it was a fascinating discussion, really insightful and really puncturing some of those myths. And I think I th echo and second your call for cultural change. We need to see corrections as retractions as less shameful. I think you and I fully much take your criticism of the point that science is self-correcting, but we're all part of that self. We all have a role to play in this. So thank you so much. Now we have loads of questions in the QA. We'll get through as many as we can and please pop your answers to that poll while these are running. So yes, we've had an awful lot of questions. We'll pass as many as possible. Uh right. Okay. I think some of the questions from early on have been answered through the presentation, through the later slides. <coughs> so I'm going to pop to a couple of ones. Okay. Sadie asks, do you have much experience of dealing with corrections relating to conflicts of interest? And do you, do you feel this is a common issue or not? And do current processes and guidance on addressing conflicts of interest work well or not? Um, I'm happy to to go first. So yeah, very good question. I've luckily, personally, I've luckily not had to deal with too many um, post publication conflict of interest situations that usually they, they become apparent um, upon, you know, submission and during review. So we can see that the say, it's usually the authors work for the company um, that, that produces, say, the product that is being discussed in the article. So we we do conduct checks upon submission to ensure we catch that. But say, say we don't, um, it can be quite a complicated process. It often, it can warrant post-publication peer review. Um, it can be, it is one of the more difficult types of misconduct to investigate post-publication and correct. It's, ve it's very dependent on the type of conflict of interest but as I say it, it, we can, it can even warrant post-publication peer review so we would issue an expression of concern very quickly to the articles, go through that, that process. We'd want to 
investigate very very promptly because uh, it does it you know the conflict of interest can have very serious impact on the the research I don't know about you Gronia if you have any comments on that. yeah I think that um being a publisher in the health sciences I think that there is the potential for uh financial conflicts of interest there because you know health sciences research there's a lot of investment there because of the um uh, kind of nature and importance of it um I think where the the and I think maybe the, again this is something that comes down to mindset change or culture change or research institutions can help I think that what is a conflict of interest versus what could be perceived as a conflict of interest is not always very well stood with it understood within the research community um so the instances I've dealt with this post-publication is the a reader noticed that individual x received funding from company Y or something like that, that relates to the research and this isn't declared. Um, and typically it's because of a, a lack of, it wasn't declared because of a lack of understanding about what needs to be declared because the individual didn't feel conflicted themselves. But I think the ICMJE um, guidance is really good around this, that a perception of a conflict of interest is can be as detrimental to the trust in the research um, as an actual conflict. Um, so I think, there is an education opportunity within the community. And this is something we do uh, routinely at Carragher to promote this um, because yeah, we trust is, is so important and something like this can really undermine the trust. Uh, and I, I echo Lauren's comment, these can be very difficult to investigate post-publication because it requires you, you an editor to, go, to get into the frame of mind that you had, had you known about this, and the manuscript is submitted how would you would you have felt uh, you know would that have impacted the peer review um, and I think that's a very difficult thing for an individual to to address. Thank you uh, Simon and Andrew and others asked whether how much of the challenges relating to corrections are linked to a sort of artifacts of potentially outdated publication processes with on publications being more and more online uh you know you've obviously mentioned both of you how digital tools can use to update readers of the existence of corrections but could a model be shifted where it's almost like sort of version tracking and articles just change and evolve naturally and so you know in a digital first world could some of the current problems in the system be corrected or would that potentially have implications for either resources or re for publishers uh, journals uh, and re and or readers who lacked access to those resources and those technologies I was I was waiting for Gronia to go first, but clearly she is waiting yeah. for me to go first. <laughs> I know this is something you feel really passionately about, so that's why I was deferring to you. Um, but I can also I can also go if you want. You go first, yeah. Okay, um. I'll, I'll I'll keep it brief because I know this is something that Lauren um, feels strongly about. I know that um, you know Lauren mentioned about a piece of research being a snapshot in time um, and not necessarily uh, the uh, updatable. Um, I think that I, I completely agree about being in a digital first um, environment. And actually I think that there are some great platforms for, you know, a, a correction is if there's a potential or founded inaccuracy in the work, whereas an evolution of a piece of research, like a correction is probably not the appropriate process to go down. Um, and there are great tools, something like Octopus, where you can show an evolution of your work um, and link to an article and it becomes part of a big story um, or a, whatever publication it is. Um, so I don't know that the corrections would be the best way to uh, address that, but I'll, I'll hand to Lauren um, a bit more about why <laughs> and her thoughts. Yeah, so in in terms of the the concept, I think the the entire system would just have to be completely overturned. You know, as I discussed, the consequences are so significant. I think because it's so rigid. Once once a work has been published and it's drawn upon another piece of of research you know that's that's done that's dusted if that if the the um earlier research is then say retracted the latter isn't updated so i think you there would have to be a complete overhaul of the entire system which and that's not to say that it shouldn't be done uh, but it would be extremely complex just at the minute with how 
the entire ecosystem operates I just don't see how it could work or be possible and as Gornia said in certain situations like I guess the cor a correction wouldn't be warranted when you know the, the if, if the research is, is evolving it's it's very yeah it's a very interesting theory um but my mind is literally going in overdrive thinking of all the different things that would need to change and work for for that to happen um so yeah a lot would have to have to be done thank you for both for your answers that was a very big question that involves a lot of kind of horizon scanning about the future of research dissemination which i appreciate is hard for any group of people to answer